Hello, and welcome to the Windows Phone 8 Jumpstart. Uh, my name's Andy Wigley, and this is Rob Tiffany. I'm Rob Tiffany, an old friend of Andy's. <laughs> All right, let's get started here. Okay, Who so, is this guy? <laughs> okay, so uh, I'm Andy Wigley. I have just joined Microsoft. Uh, I was 10 years a Microsoft MVP. I was told yesterday you have to get to 11 to, for it to mean anything, but hey. Oh. So I, I, uh, Do you get a special trophy or anything? Uh, no. Okay. So uh, I've just joined Microsoft UK. I'm working as a technical evangelist in the uh, in DPE, the Developer and Platform Evangelism, uh, doing uh, developer um, outreach events such as this, and uh, working with the field and working with our customers to uh, to help create great solutions for Windows Phone and other technologies. And I know they appreciate that. <laughs> Absolutely. So I, yeah, I live in uh, Snowdonia in North Wales, so uh, Borodar to anybody listening from Wales at the moment. And uh, uh, Shout out to Wales. Yeah. I've written a number of uh, books in the past. Uh, I was very pleased to see when I joined uh, DPE, they have a bookshelf in there, which is uh, the bookshelf of obsolete technologies and Excellent. my .NET Compact Framework core reference, That's which not... was written in 2003. Oh. Uh, is on there, but actually that's kind of harsh because it covers. Uh, it's 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 we haven't we are to version three point nine on that now. So yeah, yeah. The Compact Framework has lived on longer yeah. than people realize. Yeah. Now, for those of you who have watched the jump starts in the past, uh, you will realize that this is not Rob Miles, who uh, has been my partner in crime for these. But he is Rob. We have managed to find another Rob. Now, Rob Miles uh, intended to be here. It was our intention to have him here. Uh, he's had a few uh, few health problems. He's fixing great, but unfortunately, it meant he couldn't couldn't be here. So he sends his apologies. Uh, but his spirit lives on in this. Yes. For those of you who love uh, bad jokes and cheese, we are going to ensure that that remains in this. And the that's week. why. Yeah. That's why they got me. <laughs> My name is also Rob, and I've got a lot of bad jokes. Okay. I don't so. know if they'll be as good as Rob Miles. I hope Rob, you're watching. Uh, so it's my turn here. All right. So I, I do a lot of mobile in, enterprise mobility strategy work here at Microsoft. I work in our enterprise and partner group. Uh, known Andy for a long time. I think we met when uh, we were MVPs together. I wasn't an MVP for 10 years, unfortunately. I think just like three, something like that. So there's probably no award for that. Um, but yeah, it's got my start writing books like Andy. Uh, yeah. And it would probably be on the bookshelf of obsolete books, like uh, books on the Pocket PC and Pocket Access. Do you remember Pocket Access? Wow. Wow. Yes. Yeah, I really talked about that stuff. But, but, uh, but you, you write real books with like real stories as well. Right? Uh, oh, well, <laughs> you may oh, I have an alternate ego right. that, yes, I do write children's stories as well as computer books, so, but that's for another time. But uh, yeah, I'm excited to be here. Great. Let's get after it. All right. So let's look at the agenda. What you're going to get for the next two days. We've got uh, a packed agenda, so uh, there is a load of new stuff in Windows Phone 8. So let's let make one thing clear, that this, uh, this two days is not just aimed at people who are already Windows Phone 7 developers, but of course we're obviously going to call out all of the differences and the new things um, as we go through it. But we're also going to, we hope to have people watching this who uh, are new to Windows Phone. So uh, we've got uh, a lot of, lot of sessions there, as you can see. We've got uh, an introduction first where we're introducing Windows Phone 8 application development. We split that into two parts. So we're going to take a look at the different ways you can build apps for Windows Phone 8, and it's quite a lot expanded from what we had in Windows Phone 7. We're going to do a quick run through of all the new features at a very high level, so kind of a what's coming up over the next two days. And we're going to have a quick introduction to the development tools and tell you how to get started. So that's 1A and 1B. And then uh, the next two sessions, designing Windows Phone apps and building Windows Phone apps, this is really a, a quite a quick run through the whole process of building a Windows Phone app from conception through to building all the essential bits into it, creating some pages, uh, navigation, the data storage, and, uh, and a lot of good things. So concentrating primarily on the, the design look and feel about creating a great looking and great operating Windows Phone app. So that's what 2 and 3 is about. And then after that, we kind of dig deeper into all of the different technologies. So we're going to look at files and storage. Um, then we're going to take a 60-minute break. For us, we're over in, in Redmond, of course, in, in Washington. So uh, that'll be uh, uh, that's kind of a midday Pacific time when we're going to take a break for an hour. 
And then uh, the, uh, the second half of the day here, we're going to talk, run through the Windows Phone 8 application lifecycle, talk about background processing, the new tile story and lock screen notifications, push notifications, and then a session using phone resources, which is all about interacting with the different things that the platform uh, gives you. So interacting with uh, contacts and uh, with maps and with, uh, uh, with uh, all those kind of, and the sensors, these kind of features, and the camera. Excellent. And then tomorrow, we've got our, another packed day as well. But so there's more. There is much more. Yes. Much more. So uh, first is the erroneously named app-to-app -app communication session. Yeah. Uh, we, we keep that in a, a feeble attempt to grab your attention <laughs> because it's kind of, oh, really? App -to -app? Yeah, but it's much more than that. It's, more, oh, it's yeah. actually ways, some cute ways of launching your app and that can be from another app. But that's, that's only part of the story. And uh, looking at networking, so uh, masses of ways of, it's these, these phone devices are incredible communications devices. So there's plenty of ways that you can link your apps to data sources in the cloud, to calling out to resources out on the internet. So we're going to look at a lot of different aspects of that, including a lot of best practice about compression and, and good ways of doing that, and have a look at um, Azure mobile services and, and that kind wow. of stuff. Um, Azure is hot. It certainly is hot. Yes. So proximity sensors and Bluetooth, this is all about NFC and Bluetooth, so we've got great new a, um, APIs for doing that. Um, speech input is really good fun. Uh, we've uh, really got a very good, rich API for, doing, uh, for putting speech interaction into your apps. Uh, maps and location, we've got a new maps control. Uh, there's the wallet, we'll talk, run through that. In-app purchasing. Uh, then another break for us, and then uh, the, the second half of that day, we talk about the whole Windows Phone store, how you actually submit your apps, what the submission process is. Enterprise applications, we've got a big story for uh, creating applications and for enterprises to publish their own apps. Uh, so uh, Rob is going to give uh, the benefit of his, his uh, experience as a mobility architect and, on that session. Uh, the, how you can create apps that will from one code base that will run on Windows 8 and Windows Phone 8. And then uh, Rob's going to wrap up. We're going to take a, a, a good look at creating web apps for, uh, for Windows Phone 8. Yeah, the web's still around, as I hear. So <laughs> yeah. we'll touch on that. Excellent. OK, so shall we dive in? We should dive in. Excellent. So OK, so we're going to start with um, we're going we're gonna to start with, let's get our notes up here. We're going to introduce that Windows Phone 8 app development. Uh, this is great stuff. You're not going to be using embedded VB anymore like you might have thought, or <laughs> even embedded C++. <laughs> All right. Visual Studio 2012 is your friend. So introducing Windows Phone 8 app development. So, Excellent. Yeah. So uh, this, uh, this module, we're going to look at the new application platform in Windows Phone 8. We're going to Take a look under the covers, what's the architecture, what has really changed with Windows Phone 8. And uh, then we're going to have a look at the different application development models. There are different ways that you can build apps. Um, now, we're going to touch on each of the different ways of building apps, but I have to stress, I haven't, probably haven't stressed this already, you should have picked this up from the publicity for this event, but this is really all about building XAML apps with C Sharp. So, uh, we, we can, we'll have a quick look at the C++ and the, the mm -hmm. DirectX and the other models for building apps, um, but the rest of the content is going to be concentrating on XAML and C Sharp. Uh, we're going to look at the Windows Phone 8 version of the Windows runtime. We have a Windows Phone runtime, so what's that all about? Um, then how do you get started? Uh, we're going to, then we'll, we'll take a quick break, and then we're going to do this high-level run-through of all the new features that are, uh, uh, are in the product. We're going to look at the Windows Phone 7. How do Windows Phone 7 apps run on Windows Phone 8? What do you have to do to get that to happen? I'm not, just glad that they not, do. Not very much. They do, yeah, yes. That's it's great. a good story there. Yeah. Um, but we explain how that works and what you need to be aware of. And then finally, an introduction to getting started and getting going, creating your first little Hello World apps and getting, creating Excellent. some of them tools. So that's going to take us through the first um, 1A and 1B. That's what we're looking at here. So the first thing to say. Wow. Is, uh, what we've got is killer hardware. So we have got some great looking new phones that come from our uh, hardware partners. Great phones there from uh, Nokia, HTC, Samsung, and uh, a number of other manufacturers as well are coming forward with some great looking devices. So this is a really, they are taking a new look at the hardware, the new smartphone phone platform. So now we've got good support for multi-core chipsets. So I think all of the, uh, the phones that have been announced so far are dual-core devices. 
whole new graphics processor, increased RAM. So on Windows Phone 7.x, uh, we had the maximum spec for devices was 512 megs of RAM, uh, and there were lower spec devices at 256. That now has doubled, so most of the devices that have been released so far, uh, one gig of RAM, and then some lower spec devices right. will be coming along with 512. More screen resolutions. We've got three screen resolutions. So um, we're going to cover that um, in uh, session three this morning about how you handle uh, programming. How do you do your UI for three, handling three different screen resolutions? Uh, removable um, SD cards. We can, uh, you can actually support F SD cards and NFC, of course. Right. Now, when, uh, when the Windows Phone 8 platform was kind of uh, announced to the world, uh, back in, was it June in San Francisco? June, That's right, July. yeah, we had yeah. a big summit there. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Um, one of the key features that was called out was this shared Windows core. But there has been a little bit of confusion over what that actually means. So, I mean, it's, it's great news for the platform, right. but uh, there's been a bit of uh, misconceptions about what it means for the developer story, so let's clear that up. So the key thing is, to first of all, is to realize that what we had with Windows Phone 7.x was the core operating system on that was Windows CE, Windows Com. Who remembers Windows CE? <laughs> it's, it's still alive. It's, it's still, still alive. It's, still alive, it's yes. our favorite real-time embedded operating system. That's right. It's, and Windows CE has been around for a long time. It's a great operating system for small, battery-powered, handheld devices. It's, it's still a great operating system. There's nothing, nothing wrong with it. Um, but it, has, it, it was its own branch of the Windows family. Um, and it, it's, like I said, it's been the core operating system through all the pocket PCs and Windows Mobile right. and up to Windows Phone 7.x. Um, but there are a lot of advantages in, in actually combining the different Windows platforms. Absolutely. So, uh, so actually what we've got now is the Windows Phone 8 platform has converged at a low level in the operating system level with big Windows, with right. Windows 8. So at its, at its heart, we've got the Windows NT kernel is the same now in both. And a lot of the operating system modules are actually shared between Windows 8 and Windows Phone 8. So uh, there's, this is, has a, a number of advantages, uh, clearly, for the future of the platform. This is great foundations for future expansion Absolutely. and, and, and uh, combining the developer story. You get so many things for free just yeah, using right. Windows 8. So shared core means that you've got the kernel, networking, graphic support, file system, multimedia, the same uh, on, uh, on both platforms now. So a lot of shared components in there. So all the, all the benefits of the, the long history of these, these components in the big Windows operating system comes to Windows Phone as well. Uh, for hardware manufacturers, this is pretty appealing because the, now we've got exactly the same driver model for, for working with the hardware for both platforms. So they have some efficiencies there that they can take advantage of. Um, and Windows Phone gets all the support. So multi-core has been you know, a stalwart of uh, Windows, big Windows support for a number of years. So we've got that, that long you know, perfection of that model and the way it works comes to Windows Phone as well. And when you talk about multi-core, just the fact that we're, we get real Windows, big Windows on the phone, you, know, you might imagine it, you know, it could be a huge engineering effort to figure out how to expand to more and more cores on a phone operating system when that's all you're targeting. Just imagine now that we're now that we have Windows 8, you know, running on our platform, how much easier this gets. It means our time to market's faster. It's going to be so. I know it sounds crazy having maybe I don't know a 64 core phone, but it's not the crazy engineering effort that you might imagine it would be, since we just get this for free. We get that same shared kernel, so it's it's good stuff for us. It's good stuff for uh, our customers, no doubt about it. Sure, sure. Um, it's important to say, though, what it doesn't mean as well. Sure. So we, we're getting a good convergence uh, the, on the hardware level and the operating system level. Um, from the developer APIs, sure, we're getting a lot of convergence, and that's going to improve. Um, but we're kind of not there yet, if you like. So right. with Windows Phone 8, we have got complete support for the way we've been building stuff on Windows Phone 7.x. All of that so you can carry on. Still just creating apps just the same way you always have done. So. That's good for me, because I haven't learned any of that new stuff yet, which is why you have me here today. <laughs> Indeed. Yeah. Yeah, yeah great. Excellent. Thanks. You're making yeah, me I, feel I'm, I'm here to make you feel better. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so we will say, and we'll be calling out all the features that I have. Typically, a lot of the new stuff that's come out, NFC, some of the sensors, and we've got networking, APIs. Right. New, new stuff that has been added into Windows Phone 8 has, has been 
borrowed, if you like, or is common with what we've got on Windows 8. So you'll see a lot of commonality. Other stuff, there is some changes. So we have got a session tomorrow where we're going to dig down into what the differences really are. But Absolutely. like I say, we'll be calling it out as we go along. Absolutely. All right. Now then, let's dig down into what we've got from a dev point of view. So we are working with three whole sets of um, APIs uh, that the developers can work with. So we've got essentially uh, uh, managed application development at a high level, managed application development using Windows Phone 7.1, Windows Phone 8, uh, using .NET and Windows Phone runtime APIs. So you can carry, we've got absolute complete support for the Windows Phone 7.1 API. So you could carry on, create, create apps just the same way we've always done. That is supported. We've also got, uh, by the same sc score, so Windows Phone 7.1 apps run unchanged on Windows Phone 8. So you can still carry on creating games developed using the XNA framework. So yep, this is a managed right. framework. We'll have a look at this in a minute. So you can carry on doing that just the same. But you are going to, if, if you go for that model, obviously you can't use any of the new Windows Phone 8. Right. Right, but it definitely shows our commitment yeah. to our existing developer base yeah. and all those. I think we're over 120,000 apps in our store today, and yeah. so all those are going to work. Now, if you create a new Windows Phone 8 XAML-based app, or indeed if you take a Windows Phone 7.1 XAML-based app and then upgrade it in, uh, in, in Visual Studio, which is just a right-click upgrade to 8, then you can expand the APIs that you, are, that you can address, uh, include uh, some of the new stuff that's been added onto the .NET uh, uh, fam, uh, API set, and also the Windows Phone Runtime APIs. Right. So again, we'll dig down to those in a, in a short while. There's also a, uh, there's a C++ story for Direct 3D graphics. So if you, do, you can do a pure Direct 3D um, app, we'll look at that in a moment, which is just C++. But you can also combine, you can have a combined a kind of hybrid app where you can have most of your UIs created with XAML, but you can also incorporate some Direct 3D graphics into that. So there's a kind of hybrid model for that. Very cool. Uh, you can obviously do a pure native C++ uh, DirectX Direct 3D application and that is really that is targeted for the games development community right good stuff now there's also a strong nat this native development runs right through all of these development models so if you've got a windows phone 8 xaml based app either the pure xaml or the hybrid xaml and direct 3d you can also call out to native libraries and incorporate native code into all of these application models so Look a little bit deeper into what those three different API sets look like. The .NET API is the primary API for managed developers. And uh, as I said, includes everything that you are used, you've been used to using in uh, Windows Phone OS 7.1. Uh, it contains all the classes and types from those, those namespaces. And there's been a whole bunch of new stuff has been added into here as well, uh, which is uh, the wallet, uh, share media tasks, you can see the list there. Now, the Windows Phone runtime, this is where we're getting a lot of commonality with, right. with Windows 8. This is a subset of the full WinRT, the, the Windows runtime that we've got on Windows 8, plus some phone-specific additions. So a, you, you don't need to know this, but it's actually implemented in C++, and then they, they, what they say is it's projected out. So you get a kind of a, an addressable API layer on right. top of that. So the, anything, all, any of the, uh, the methods and types that are in the Windows runtime uh, can be accessed by uh, C Sharp and VB.NET developers through uh, as managed code, and also from native developers, C++. So they're projected out to these different uh, programming models. So it won't look strange to a managed developer. It'll seem familiar to them. Indeed. Yeah, just like they're doing right. .NET development. Sure, sure. Now, here's, this is an important thing. HTML5 JavaScript projection, which some of you may be familiar with Win with Windows 8, is not supported on Windows Phone 8. We do have an HTML5 app application story. We'll come on to that in a moment. But the, the, the WinJS model, right. the, the JavaScript and HTML5 model that you're seeing on Windows 8 is not supported on Windows Phone. So what we've got with the Windows Phone runtime is a subset of the full WinRT. So around about 2,000, 2,500 or so members of the full WinRT API set. So it's not it's any It's cool, yeah. yeah. And, a lot a of, and a lot of stuff that is excluded is stuff that don't make sense on a phone, basically. So. Right. Um, and we've also got some new stuff as well, like the speech API. It's kind of, maybe this is 
like the phone is going to lead the way, and it is. maybe this is going to come to Windows 8. That's not an Speech announcement. Is a... <laughs> That's not an announcement, folks. But yeah, it would Eddie Wiggly me. just made an announcement today <laughs> for a new product. Yeah. The speech is a game changer, I think, Andy. And it I, is. And I know we'll dive into that more later. It's a, it's a fun session to look at the speech. It's, a, it's, it's fun. It's easy to integrate into your app. Definitely. Definitely. You can do very complex speech-based apps as well. Can you but, imagine just yeah. building apps where it's just a conversational application? Mm -hmm. You're just talking to it, not even you looking. Can, you can do that. Yeah, amazing stuff. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, we'll dig, on, dig into that tomorrow. So, yeah, loads of stuff in there. Um, uh, this does mean there's an interesting side effect with this for the managed code developer. So what this actually means is that in certain areas, if you're doing a Windows Phone 8 application, mm -hmm. you've actually got a choice of two API sets that do pretty much exactly the same thing, right. <laughs> but they're slightly different. So you've got the old, if you, if you like, the old school Windows Phone 7.1 API set in the .NET API. Classic example of that is the isolated storage APIs for right. storing files down into in persistent storage on the phone. Um, and or you can actually today you could write new code and use the windows.storage APIs where which is writing code that is common that is consistent with what you would do on Windows 8 and there's some other sockets thread pool sensors so there's there's a bunch of these guys now so which should you use well it kind of depends where you're coming from really if you are taking an existing Windows Phone 7 app and you're upgrading it to 8 and you're adding some Windows Phone 8 fe new features to it then it makes sense to uh, to just stay with the APIs you know, that you've already used for those bits that you've got working code. Don't reinvent the wheel. It's working. It's great. If, however, you're doing a new development today and you're going to be looking at creating a Windows 8 version from the same code base, then clearly you're going to want to go with the, uh, the Windows RT. It's fair to say that going forwards, uh, new, any new enhancements that are going to be added to the platform in future releases are going to tend to end up in the uh, Windows runtime API set. So, you, you probably want to be making a steady move over to those programming models if you're coming from a, a Windows Phone 7.1 uh, background. Definitely, I agree. All right. So, uh, next, finally, we got yeah the uh, native API. So, we've got a subset of uh, Win32 and COM APIs. Uh, we've got WinSock in there, and there's like native camera APIs, and there's a whole bunch of COM stuff. So, this is in there with a couple of Goals really is mainly of interest to native code developers, um, and mm -hmm. it's in there uh, for porting existing native libraries you might have, or it's there to help like the native gaming community or people who are coming from other platforms where you've got C or C++ code. Um, this is a, a, a route to you to be able to port those more easily onto the Windows Phone platform. Um, so managed applications, I've said this, you know, there is a hybrid model all the way through this. You can create native libraries and call them from your managed code. So there are going to be some cases where you're going to want to do that. All right. So that's the API sets. Excellent. Let's take a look now at actual, at a pretty high level, at yeah. just some of the different apps that we can now create. Good idea. So this is the main topic of this course. XAML UI with managed code. So uh, if you're a Windows Phone 7 you're app developer, you may be wondering what's happened to Silverlight. Where's this Silverlight term gone? Um, it's kind of just been deprecated, if you like. Silverlight is a thing that grew out of a browser plugin for rich, uh, for rich internet applications. Uh, so it started life as a um, completely browser resident on the desktop. WPFE. WPFE was its right. code name. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so, and that was, it was, it was there, and it was also cross-platform, so the idea was, many years ago, yeah. that, it, that this would be a great way of creating uh, rich internet uh, applications uh, resident in the browser. And then it came out of the browser, right. so you could actually install those Silverlight applications onto your desktop. And then Windows Phone 7 came along, and they kind of took that out of browser model and made it the primary app development model for Windows Phone 7 apps. Um, and there was no actually in browser model at all on Windows Phone 7. Right, absolutely. But it's kind of, you know, it's kind of gone away from, uh, and, and the whole thing of browser plugins is, is kind of losing, uh, losing uh, credence really in the industry. So No, you're right, it has been yeah. trailing off. Yeah. So, so we've kind of gone, we've sort of taken a step back from the Silverlight term, and now we just talk about XAML based applications. But the key thing here is that it's kind of the same that you always used to know. So, XAML in Windows Phone 8 is the same. Uh, the same XAML that you're used to working with if you're coming from so Phone 7.1. Uh, 
So your logic is written using C-sharp, Visual Basic.net, and uh, you're accessing the .NET APIs and the Windows Phone runtime. Right, so if we're going to switch over to, uh, to the demo machine. Uh, this is Visual Studio 2012. Uh, we'll talk about the different flavors of that right. coming up. But we've got, so I'm going to create myself a new project here. And uh, this is the uh, ultimate, here's the Windows Phone category. So we see we've got a whole bunch of new project templates that we can choose from. Windows Phone app, data bound app, class library, panorama, pivot. Uh, and different flavors of these. So I'm just going to create me a uh, uh, let's create, me, create me a panorama app. Uh, and you get a drop down, okay, you know, which, ta which phone version do you want to support? So in Visual Studio 2012, you can create apps for Windows Phone OS 7.1. You can carry on doing uh, apps for that platform. And of course, there's going to be a lot of phones out in the market that are still running 7.1 uh, for a long time to come. So that still makes a lot of sense. Uh, for the target, the new phones only, then you select Windows Phone OS 8.0. And uh, you create a new a starter project from the project template, and it, this is a fully functioning application that has everything you need to get started with this particular style of application. So those templates are different styles of Startrap. So let's just hide this. This is uh, XAML, this XML that you see here, Solution Explorer if you're not used to Visual Studio. And there's our design surface. Let me just shrink that down a bit so you can see a bit better. Uh, and this is a, this panorama, if you're not used to this, is one of the classical UI models that we have for Windows Phone. So Windows Phone is quite innovative compared to other smartphone platforms, the way it makes use of the, the sort of limited screen space. And I'm going to run this on the phone emulator, this panorama app. And you'll see what I mean by the innovative approach to, to handling. So I hope you saw there, uh, depending on how fast you are internally, <laughs> I hope you saw the nice and buttery smooth animation. Very buttery, floating. yes. So this is, uh, you'll see that this, a panorama app is structured into sort of islands of information. So I can swipe across, um, across to the right. And we see, and you can see actually just bleeding onto the canvas at the side there, you can see a hint that there is more to see as well. And it actually is circular, so there's actually three islands of information. And as you can see, in a panorama, they don't, they don't have to be bounded by the frame of the page. This third item is actually, uh, is actually wider than the, uh, the, the physical screen. But you think of the, the screen then becomes a, 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 like a window frame looking onto some, a bigger canvas behind. And it becomes very natural for the user to swipe from side to side with their finger to, uh, to see the, more of the content. So when you get to uh, f item three, then we're back to first item and second item. So this is one of the nice uh, models. And you get a 3D effect. The background actually moves at a different speed as you're navigating across uh, compared to the foreground data. So is that nice. called, is that, para is that a parallax? Parallax, that's what it is. Yeah. yeah. It's definitely yeah. something you don't see on any other mobile platform. No. So the anatomy of this, like I said, there's your design surface. This is XAML. This is an XML application markup language, which is how you define your UI. And over the right, we've got the Solution Explorer for, uh, for exploring the different files that make up this solution. All right, let's uh, switch back to, the, back to the slides. And right, so the next model, XNA games using managed code. So um, there was a lot of debate, was XNA dead? XNA is not dead, XNA oh. is still with us. Oh, but it's fair to say that it's not been enhanced either. So right. what we've got is full support for XNA game development. Um, exactly the same API set that you may have been used to using for 7.1. So this is still a great platform for writing simple games uh, for Windows Phone um, and indeed for Xbox and, uh, and Windows 7. So uh, same new project templates as Visual Studio 2010. So you can't use any of the new Windows Phone 8 side of things. And we have project templates for that. If you go back to the demo slide again, demo machine. Um, new project for this. So you'll find the XNA templates uh, actually not in the Windows Phone category, but you need to go down to XNA Game Studio 4. And here you can see we've got a Windows Phone game, Windows Phone game library. Uh, actually, yeah, I believe there is a. Yeah, so there's a Windows Phone XML and XNA hybrid app pro project template in the Windows Phone category as well. Uh, but let's just create ourselves a, a, a straight Windows Phone game. Uh, okay, that. 
This one is still in C sharp and VB, uh, but it's like for simple games. Uh, there, it's just code. There actually isn't any XAML on this. There's nothing you can look at in the graphical designer. Uh, the, it's all code driven. The way XNA games work is that you essentially have four methods that are key. So I've initialized where you initialize your game. Yes. Load content where you load all the resources into memory, get the game ready to run. Uh, and then essentially you just, it calls update and draw 30 frames per second, 30 times per second. It calls update, so you just move your objects around the, the game world. You have your logic in there to calculate for collisions or bounces and this kind of stuff. And you'll update the state of all your game pieces. And then draw simply draws it all to the screen. So a default uh, game is not terribly exciting. But I think anyone who wants to get into game development Oh, yeah. There's no better place to start than Absolutely. with XNA. Yeah. Now Rob Miles, if he was here, bless him, would it's uh, this is his his expertise. He's, uh, yes. Yeah. He, he uses XNA to teach. He's a lecturer at Hull University. He uses this as a great way of teaching programming because it's such a nice, well-factored object model. Uh, this is a game. Uh, yeah. Okay. That's a beautiful game, isn't it? Yeah. And actual fact, the only thing this game does is you can press the back button. And is that it the cornflower blue corn game? Blue, which is the traditional XNA. Excellent. Model. All right, uh, that was X and A. Back to the slides. And the next one, Direct3D. So this is the whole new one. Direct3D app is written entirely in native code, uh, and it only uses Direct3D for its UI. This is a game for the, this is the new gaming model for right. Windows Phone. But the key thing here is of all these um, application development models we're showing you here, this is the one that is most, you've got most commonality with uh, Windows 8. So if you create a Windows 8 game, it will be using these same technologies and a very high degree of, your, of the, the logic and the objects that you create for that Windows 8 game, you'll be able to use in your Windows Phone 8 version. So the game engine, everything will just come across. You may have to resize, obviously, some graphical um, assets and that sort of thing. Absolutely. Um, but that's, yeah, the Direct 3D, so that's, uh, that's the next one. Now you can also, like I said, you can actually combine this with a XAML app as well. So you can actually have a rich XAML app with uh, with some direct 3D graphics in it. And I can show you an example of that on the demo machine. New project. Let's go back to Windows Phone category. And there's, we'll use this hybrid one. This is, not that one, this one. Windows Phone X, XAML and direct 3D. So let's run it first, show you what it does. And all these are, you know, created, creating new projects that you can then use as the starting point for creating your, your real app. So fully functional uh, projects that you get out of new project templates. And it's still creating that project, taking a little while. Because it's, it's, when, whenever you've got C++ code in there, Visual Studio has, seems to have to do a bit more work to get the thing. Definitely. Get the thing going. But you definitely have the requisite 3D cube. We have the 3D. You have to have is that. that. Is that a, a requisite? It is. Okay. It is. Just to let people know, that's what we're doing. You know. You see, at the bottom, we got parsing included files. This is the. It has a bit more work to do with uh, with C plus plus. Right. Nothing says direct 3D like the rotating cube. Right. <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, it's finally loaded. Let's run it. Uh, here's the emulator come up again, and there we go. Oh, there it Ooh. is. Wow. Isn't that lovely? If we could just, can we bask in this for a moment? Mm, this is just great. Just that. All right. Okay, bored of that. Okay, and carry on now. Yeah. So the just to look at the, if you look at the Solution Explorer on the right here, sure we've got a, a XAML page here. That's what we're looking at here. Uh, but actual fact, this has got a. If we look in actually into the XAML, it's got a an object, an element in here called a drawing surface. So this is a, a XAML element, which is a drawing surface into which you can draw 3D graphics. And the 3D graphics is all in this uh, phone XAML Direct 3D app 2 comp project over here. Uh, there's a cube renderer, and I'm certainly not going to dig into all of that code now. But you can see how you've got this nice hybrid model. You can actually have some rich 3D graphics uh, into, your, into your XAML app. You don't want to scare people by showing them C++ code? No. Not okay. The, out all of right. scope. Okay. All right. Back to the slides. Now. This is a key, uh, key thing and key deliverable for Windows Phone 8, is that managed apps can also interact with native libraries. 
So leaving right. aside the direct 3D graphics, we can actually have native libraries in there. So you can add a uh, C++ uh, a Windows Phone runtime component project to a managed XAML solution. So in that, in that native code library, you could have some WinSock stuff, but only the only purpose, WinSock is a, is a sockets API for networking. So I wouldn't recommend, that doesn't give you anything you can't do more easily and in managed manage code, but uh, if you've got some legacy code that uses WinSock, it means you can actually uh, port that library across and but use it fairly easily within your, uh, within your, your native applications. Uh, so what would you do this for? So uh, there's um, a number of scenarios where this becomes useful. So, yeah, when, when you want to use this, is for all Windows Phone 8 apps can use native code, but not all apps need to. So, uh, but, so for many app scenarios, a managed app provides the same features and performance as an app that uses native code. And actually, there's some enhancements uh, compiled in the cloud, which I'll talk about in a while, right. which make managed apps behave, it work even faster than they, uh, they used to do on Windows Phone 7.1, quite substantially in some cases. But the following are three reasons why you may want to use native code in your app. First of all, this portability. So if you're targeting multiple platforms, right. platforms from other vendors, it may make sense to implement your core functionality in a native library that you can be used on all of the platforms you're targeting. This is something particularly, obviously, the gaming industry is keen on. Direct 3D graphics, that one we just looked at. If your app needs to use some Direct 3D to render some complex uh, graphics to the screen, then you're going to, again, use this native code library to do that. Um, but the most one that's probably going to be of most use to people is performance. So for some scenarios, and for some scenarios, not all, you can achieve a performance benefit in large computation tasks by using native code. Um, and I've yep. got an example of this which illustrates actually two things. Both of all, how it works, yeah. but also uh, why it's not always necessarily a good thing. It's, okay, it's excellent. Kind of, it's a kind of anti-demo, this one. Oh, that's what we're all hoping for, is an <laughs> anti-demo to go with our anti-presentation. Yeah. So, Excellent. on the demo machine, please, and I have to go and find, I've got a sample for this one. So, I hope it's some kind of quantitative analysis. No. Okay. It's not. All, All right. right. And I have to thank Peter Tor on the phone team for this, this demo. So Thanks, Peter. Here. Uh, I'm going to run this up on the emulator. Uh, it needs to build it, clearly, to make it work. You don't say. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and here is the emulator. Now, here we've got a nice picture of, um, I don't know what. Is that the Bellagio? Uh, tell me, you tell me. Is that in? In Las Vegas? Las Vegas, OK, there you go. Not to be confused with Bellagio on Lake Como. OK, so this has got, it's, it's a big, this is a big image. If you look on the right, large.jpg is the, uh, can we look at the properties of that? Uh, oh, it doesn't tell you. Anyway, so it's, it's a very big, it's off, just off the bottom of the screen, unfortunately, on this resolution. But it's a very large, trust me, it's a very large image. Uh, now, what happens when you press this Go button uh, is that some processing happens. And we've now got the same images on the top. But if I scroll up, down here we've got two Ooh. black and white versions of the same thing. Why have we got two, Rob? I have no idea. I shall tell you. Excellent. So there's two versions there. Actually, what it is, this is, is we've taken the original image and we have converted it to, mon to black and white, right. to grayscale. And it's been done twice, once with pure managed code and once with native code, ah. uh, just to show that there's two ways of doing this sort of thing. So you might have thought that doing that sort of thing is the com computationally intensive sort of thing that would, should be done uh, in, uh, in native code. Uh, in actual fact, uh, this, this sample is, uh, it was used to sort of instrument this. In actual fact, in this particular case, it's faster to do it in managed code. So that just get out of time. Yeah, it illustrates the fact that, that just uh, it's happened, not, you're folks. not always going to necessarily get the gains that you're going to want. But for a lot of scenarios, it is going to be um, a useful solution for getting native code incorporating it in. Let me show you the code just so you get a flavor for what's going on. You need on. to prove to them that it's managed code that's going faster. This is what I'm going to do. Excellent. So um, let's see. Now that's create grayscale native is the one that calls out to our native library. So we've got uh, this is our uh, native. This is native code C plus plus. Hold on to your hats. Yeah, it's all right. It doesn't hurt. Uh, yeah. Oh. It, it's yeah. It's beautiful. It is. I actually am a C plus plus developer from a long time ago, but uh, it is a long time ago. Yeah. You're uh, yeah, that's right. So I've been managed for quite a few years. I'm going to 
We tend to stay that way. We prefer to have you managed. <laughs> yes, it's much better. <laughs> Um, so that's the native code for doing that. And then there's a create grayscale managed, which is, this is this. We create a writable bitmap. You get an array of pixels from the writable bitmap where you load in the image into it. And they call this make grayscale, which basically does a, uh, both of these do the same thing. They do a for, in, a for each around every pixel right. in, the, uh, in the image, and they do this computation. So there's a lot of pixels in this particular image. It's a huge image. So a lot of work. Um, and this processing just shifts the um, the alpha, the RGB, so we end up with a monochrome image. Okay. Uh, but yeah, the interesting thing because when you shift, you have to shift all that data across the uh, managed native library. Right. This, there is some overheads for that. So this is why this is why this particular example actually is quicker to do it in, in managed code. But, that's good to know. Yeah. But if you've got something that's a bit more intensive image processing, something a bit more uh, significant than simply doing a grayscale, then you are going to see performance enhan enhancement by shifting that off into native code. Like maybe if you needed to do some kind of quantitative stuff where you're uh, maybe taking weather analysis for the last 50 years and then you need to project forward curves to figure out how much heating oil is going to cost. You might want to do that in you C++. Took the words out of my mouth. Yeah, or abuse a supercomputer while you're at it. <laughs> or right. shift it to the cloud. Let or work. shift it to the cloud. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, As a routine this. example of how you might use C++. As a C++. routine, the sort of thing you're yes. always going to want to do. Right. Yeah. Pretty standard, really. Back to the slides. Yes. All right. So that was, that was the hybrid model. Um, we see a lot, we're going to see a lot of interesting stuff happening here. So. Oh, that was the demo. That was the demo. That was the demo. So we'll just move right on up past that. OK, HTML5. So I've already said, this is the key thing, that WinJS um, projection model that we have, the Windows 8 style HTML5 JavaScript app development, is not supported on Windows Phone 8. But what we do have is Internet Explorer 10. And this is one of those components. This is another thing that kind of uh, where we get the benefits of the combining of the platforms. That, yes. So uh, the Internet Explorer 10 has a very high percentage of the code in the, in the Windows Phone version. It's identical to the desktop browser. So uh, we've got a really great new JavaScript processing engine, which is four times faster than we had on Windows Phone 7. Chakra. Yeah, that's, is that what it's called, yeah. Yes. So Rob here is the, the, the web guy for the, on this team. So. Yeah. Great support for HTML5. So uh, we've got twice the feature, su feature support compared to what we had on the previous version. So we've got a really capable browser on the phone. And we can make use of that in, in, uh, in apps, sort of where you are. You've got a native shell right. hosting a web browser control. And even though we use the term hybrid app loosely about other things, many of you out in the mobile development world will know the true what hybrid app actually is. A lot You see a lot of them out there is basically absolutely when you take a native app and put a browser control, and then that browser can communicate with the platform and vice versa. That's when you want to leverage your HTML and JavaScript skills, but you still want to get it into the store uh, you know, versus just reaching out to a URL to, to go to a website. Uh, and, and obviously, the, the, aside from getting it into a store where people can discover it that way, uh, building these hybrid apps, like Andy will show you here, uh, also uh, allows you, if there's something in HTML5 that you cannot do uh, that only native code can do, but maybe you've got a lot of a high skill set around HTML, um, this hybrid app will let you communicate with the platform uh, natively. And so your JavaScript on the page could call a, a C-sharp function, for instance, or a VB function that's in native code that'll allow you to access to the platform, maybe like the accelerometer or something like that that you know HTML5 doesn't support. And then vice versa, the platform can call up into a JavaScript function and pass information back to the page. And so it's a, it's a great scenario if you have that HTML5 skill set. Sure, yeah. And if we go to the demo machine, we'll just show you what you get from the project templates. So there is, we have even got a Windows Phone HTML5 app project template in here. Uh, this is... Uh, not super exciting, it has to be said. But it's got some HTML content in it, which, when it finishes loading, there we go. Uh, it's got an index.html page. That's Next. it, HTML. So there's nothing specifically HTML5 about this sample, but it is you know, a starting block. And nor does this show the interop between uh, managed code and native, but, um, but that definitely is um, the way to, as Rob says, to call out to stuff that you can't do in HTML5. Uh, what does that look like? Well, spookily, it looks rather like 
a regular, wow, native, uh, regular XAML app. That's spooky. It is spooky. But this is HTML. This is HTML being shown in a web browser control. Isn't it? So, so that model is there for you. And uh, there's a lot of um, there's a lot of interest in developing for that because clearly, if you're developing a lot of your content in HTML5, you've got a degree of portability with other platforms. So uh, this Absolutely. is Absolutely. yeah. Okay. Uh, so that was that model. Okay. So back to the slides. So finally, in this part of this first session. Um, what about existing Windows Phone 7.x apps? What's the story with this? How do those run on, is there, what's the problems, if there are any, with running those on Windows Phone 8? So the good news is, in general, if you have the, any apps that you have written for 7.1, you can take that compiled output, that zap file, it will install straight onto Windows Phone 8. So the, uh, how many do we have? 100 120, uh, probably more than that. 130,000 apps at the present. Three, about 300 apps per day. Yeah, it's growing at three, yeah, um, three, uh, yeah, th 300 per day. So it's growing fast. Uh, all of those existing apps run just great on Windows Phone 8. Well, nearly all. There's a, there were a few that were created with a uh, re reduced distribution um, hybrid API, mm -hmm. which had native code on Windows Phone 7. Those have to, but it, we're talking about a very small number of apps. Absolutely. Those have to be uh, rebuilt. Um, on the whole, Windows Phone 7.1 apps will work great on Windows Phone 8. Now, there's a difference, there's something you have to be aware of if you just ship your ready compiled Windows Phone 7 app and run it on Windows Phone 8, or whether you can upgrade it to Windows 8. And let me explain what we're talking about here. So your Windows Phone 7.1 app will run without compilation and straight works great on Windows Phone 8. But clearly the underlying platform the developer platform, the libraries that we are calling out to when we make API calls are the Windows Phone 8 versions mm -hmm. on the phone. They are pre-installed in burn into ROM. They are already on the phone. So there is something called the quirks mode, which I've lost a graphic for. Where's it gone? There we go. There it There's is. The quirks. There's there those quirks. There's quirks, yeah. So there's a, a quirks layer. So the thing is, the compact framework, .NET compact framework, which is what we were building against on Windows Phone 7.x, it had a, a few idiosyncrasies, shall we say, a few ways a of few. doing things, but it, it, that differed in subtle ways from the way that the core CLR, which is the .NET runtime that we, uh, we developed against for Silverlight, desktop Silverlight apps, core CLR was the .NET runtime for that. Now, actually, with Windows Phone 8, we are also, we are using Core CLR. So Core CLR is now our .NET underlying runtime. But like I said, there are a few subtle differences, and I'll, I'll call those out in a moment, between uh, .NET CF ways things worked and the Core CLR ways thing, APIs, APIs worked. All right. So in Core CLR, the idea is that actually they, they considered the .NET CF way of doing things like uh, non-optimal, shall we say? Certainly. <laughs> uh, so that, 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 those there are a few kind of breaking changes, if you like, uh, between the two different uh, runtimes. So what the Quirks layer is there for is to sort of retrofit the broken .NET CF behavior back onto the core CLR API. So it allows you, your, this is why your Windows Phone 7.1 compiled app will work just the same as it did on, Win, uh, on when it was running on a Windows Phone 7 device. And it will run, it will behave in the same way when it's running on a Windows Phone 8 device. However, if you then take that same app and you upgrade it, which is just a right click in Visual Studio saying upgrade to 8, and then it will just run, and you're now a Windows Phone 8 app without having to make any code changes at all. Your same code, will exactly so you haven't changed your code, it will right. be running on a Windows Phone 8 device, but the Quirks layer is removed. So you're running against those underlying API implementations un, you know, unchanged. Right, it's absolutely. the new way of working it. Now, on the, most of the time, this is not going to cause you any problems, but there's a few edge cases where, which you need to be aware of, which are documented, where you can have some problems. So there's two scenarios you have to consider here. First of all, there's the source code incompatibility, which means that um, a, uh, some of the actual, the actual APIs behave differently. They call, give you back different results. Right. Uh, and then the other things is binary app compatibility and this incompatibility. And this is things like re basic changes in the behavior of the platform, uh, which, which cannot be quirked. And 
one example of that is the garbage collector, which cleans up managed objects. Uh, we've now got a very, very efficient one. We, the benefit is thing, another thing that makes our apps run faster on Windows Phone 8. Uh, we've got a great new garbage collector. Um, and the, but, you know, this, and this is a good example of the subtle things that can go wrong. Objects are finalized, meaning that they are tidied up. And sometimes you can have finalization code that runs when an object is finally destroyed. Very rarely used, but there are some cases. Now, if you haps, perhaps inadvertently were expecting that finalization to ha happen in a certain sequence, mm -hmm. that sequence might be changed on Windows Phone. Right. So these are some of the subtle things that can go wrong. Speaking of a subtle thing, I just want to remind the audience that we do have a poll question up right now, and we'd love for you to answer it. Uh, in order to see that, it's a, you might have to drop from your full screen mode in order to see the poll, but we'd love to have your participation. Yeah, absolutely. And back to Andy. Thank you. <laughs> And back to the slide, yeah. Yes. So this, this, is a, this is an example of source code incompatibility. You'll need to look at the docs for this, the Windows Phone app platform compatibility. But to pick out a couple of these, for example, the XML serializer, which we, is a class we use for taking objects in memory and turning them into XML for storage right. in a file. On, in, in Windows Phone OS 7.1, in .NET Compact Framework mode, if you like, you didn't need to have a default constructor. So a constructor is one where you don't take any arguments. Uh, so you didn't need to provide one of those. Whereas if uh, that, that exact same code, you try and run it when you are running in Windows Phone 8 mode, then you'll get an exception because you have to have a default constructor. So this is pretty subtle stuff. Uh, mutex classes, names cannot include a backslash character on, on Windows Phone 8, whereas running in quirks mode, that is allowed. Right. So, you know, this is it's hardly going to affect very many people. But if you do, when you upgrade an app to 8 and you start seeing some, some slightly strange behaviors like that, then have a look at this documentation because you may be hitting one of these, uh, these quirks uh, in, incident things. Um, okay, so um, binary app incompatibility. This is all about the, uh, the differences in the platform. So background file transfers, for example, you know, we now have a up, an upgraded limit. You can actually have 25 file transfers going on rather than five. Now, maybe Excellent. your code assumed that you, weren't, that you were going to get an exception when you try and queue up a sixth. So right. this is kind of, you know, so, but it's not going to happen now. So if you're looking for that, then you're going to... 25 is a lot. It is a lot. It yeah. is a lot. Access to private nested classes. So uh, it's all pretty subtle stuff, but uh, just to raise that to your, for your attention. You know, Andy, we're getting a lot of questions about WinJS yep. coming in. And I know we kind of talked about it briefly, about how you're going to do HTML5 on our platform. But just to reiterate, on the Windows Phone platform, on Windows Phone 8, we, we don't have WinJS like you might have if you're doing a native development for uh, big Windows, Windows RT. Um, and so we, you know, when we talk about HTML5 and JavaScript, it's definitely in the context of that hybrid application where you have the app with a browser control to build those style of apps. Uh, and the, the cool thing is, as Andy showed you, those web pages can be in, in local storage on the device or like other hybrid apps work, they'll pull it down from a website and work offline using App Cache. Uh, that is going to be your way to do HTML5 and JavaScript apps on the, our new platform versus WinJS, which you can use on, on big Windows 8. So hopefully we can clear that up. A Great. little distinction. Great. Thank, thanks, Rob. Um, okay. So um, wrapping up this particular bit. It looks like we're we wrapping up. We are done. We are done. So uh, we're just going to take a short break now. Um, we'll... We, Keep your questions coming. We'll kind of answer as, as many of those who can during the break as well. So uh, we're going to take, is it five, ten minutes? Five minutes. Five minute break. So ten minutes. Ten There's minute break. Two hands I, with I saw, five fingers. Yeah, so the back of the room there. These we're going to use advanced mathematics up. here you, you today, should, folks. You should see all the equipment we're facing us here. Yes. Tonight. It's quite impressive. It's so, uh, thanks for your attention so far. Uh, we'll be back. So in the next session, we're going to come back, and now we're going to run through all of the new features at a high yeah. level, uh, kind of what's coming up right. in the rest of this. And then we're going to dig down into a lot of your questions about uh, using different platforms for development. This is coming up in the next session, so hopefully we'll answer your questions there about what you can run the tools on and what, what you can't and what the hardware recs are. And uh, so we'll see you in 10. Thanks see you much. in 10. Thank you.